I'm Naomi Shehab Nye, and I'm very proud to be here with my friend Carrie Clack. And I want to thank Gemini Inc. for hosting this conversation this evening, and also Trinity University Press for being a friend to all of us and for publishing Carrie's amazing book uh, years ago, but it still feels so fresh to me. I was rereading it today and felt as if it had just been published only yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Trinity University Press, and thank you, Alexandra, for all the work you've done to put the Ink Stravaganza together and all of your crew, your team there. Uh, they've been working very hard. Now, I have to check because um, we have been having a few tech issues here. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? You can hear me. Okay. Um, it is a great honor to be here with Kerry Clack. I honestly feel um, he should have been the first person honored by Gemini Inc. all those years ago. I don't even know how many years the honoring experience has been happening, but Kerry, you have been with us so exquisitely and so long that it is um, long overdue. And I'm so happy that it's happening now. Uh, when you titled your book for Trinity University Press, Clowns and Rats Scare Me, um, I wonder if you had the slightest idea how many other things might come along to scare us um, as the years went by. Would you just talk about, you know, I remember thinking it was a very funny title when I first read it, and I thought it would grab people's interest if they didn't know who you were. I know that people I gave the book to in other cities who didn't know you at all were immediately captivated by the title. But I remember thinking then that it was kind of brave of you to use the word scare in a title. Uh, no longer does it seem that brave. It seems like we're living in a high state of anxiety on every single day. Um, could you just talk about the title and your living with it these 11 years? Well, first, uh, thanks to, to Tom and, and Trinity University Press. Thanks, uh, Alexandria and Gemini Inc. Uh, for the honor for all this. And Naomi, my sister, my friend of 25 years, thank you so very much for, for doing this. Uh, actually, um, I, I forgot who, but someone at Trinity University Press came up with the title and they had a couple of titles and they ran it by you first and you liked it. The other one was really, was really pedestrian and, and serious. And, uh, but when uh, this was suggested to me, I loved it because it's, it's true. And uh, I, don't, I don't mind telling people what I'm afraid of. And, right. and I, I do agree that there are things that, that to be afraid of now that I couldn't have imagined 10, 11 years ago. Well, I'm very happy to take any minor credit for that title at all then. I, I didn't remember that, but I love it because it's so tactile and so engaging. And, um, you know, any child would want to jump up and down and say what they're scared of if they hear your title. Carrie, um, you have a voice which for all of us has been like a part of our, um, our family, our, our thinking, our way of seeing the world. And I know you say in your own introduction in your book that you had a first grade teacher who was remarkably also your mother's first grade teacher, now that's pretty rare, yeah. who told your mama that you would be a writer. And you say that you were never not writing, that you were always writing things down. Uh, then in third grade, you wrote an essay, Black People Are People Too. And could you tell us any memories you have about just that childhood um, sense of words being a tool in your pocket, something you could use? Sure. I, again, I, I don't remember not, not writing or reading, and it was Mrs. Mrs. Wyatt who told my my mom that I'd be a writer. I always remember just writing stories and poems and stuff and and just writing things. And and that particular essay in the third grade, that's 
I'd give almost anything if I could see it. I remember late in the afternoon, sitting in the back of the class, having free time and writing it. And if I'm in third grade, then that means it's, it's, 19, it's the 1968-69 school year. I don't know what, what compelled me to write it. I don't know what compels an eight-year-old to write about race. And, and I remember that that, that that night, my mom was going through my, my stuff, my school stuff, and she saw it. And I was embarrassed about it. She asked, you know, what was this for? And I just said it was a school assignment. Hmm. And I, 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 again, there's, there's not too much I wouldn't give to be able to read it. I remember it, 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 it filled one page, side of one page, but I have no idea what, what the words that were in it and what, and what made me feel like I had to write that down. Well, I hope it turns up one of these days, folded in a book somewhere, and you get a chance to hold it. Uh, so you don't recall a particular event that precipitated your writing that. You just, it just came for you. No, but it had to be something. Yeah. It had to be something. I, 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 it's, not some, it's not like we sat around all day talking about race and about being Black. It had to be something I absorbed, maybe something... Yeah. I saw on TV. I, I just don't know. Or maybe you just had a very strong conscience and a sense of uh, humanity that was already alive and awake in you and, and that line came to you. Um, I'm very touched also in your own introduction to your wonderful book when you talk about how in the early days when you were having your columns published in East Side Newspapers in San Antonio that you didn't even want your picture used uh, because you didn't, you weren't trying to put yourself forward. It was always that voice that you were putting forward. Um, did, could you say anything about what it was like in those days? You know, I love the details of tucking your column, you know, in the mail slot and taking, taking them to the papers. I'm I'm shy. I mean I'm 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 shy and and when I started writing these essays, columns, whatever, uh, yeah, I would slip them over the transom of the San Antonio Snap on East Houston Street. And it was literally it was a transom, and I would I would do it early in the morning before anybody got there because I was you know embarrassed, shy, and you know didn't think it was really worth it. And then Mr. Coleman, Eugene Coleman, who uh, owned the paper, he, he, after two or three of those, he called me and he wanted to give the column a name and, and run my picture. He didn't say anything about paying me, but he did want to run my picture. And I just said, no, nah. I mean, I was, I, I just, it just, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the reason why I was doing it. And uh, I mean, even now today, I, I received, I got the, the postcard from Gemini Inc. about the, Travaganza next next week, and I see this big picture of myself, and and which you know was that took me aback. But then what really took me aback, and I didn't realize until after we had started the Zoom sessions, so I'm wearing the same shirt that I had on in that picture that was taken <laughs> like two years ago. So, so. <laughs> I like that, Carrie. That speaks well for you. I think that's good. <laughs> Um, I love the picture, by the way, on the card <laughs> for Inkstravaganza. It was a beautiful choice. I think I'm going to put mine on the wall after uh, next week is over. It's really special. I'm curious, before you read, will, will you agree to read a piece from your book for us, maybe? Yeah, I did. And, I, and, and I, you know, I, I, for, I can't access any of my, except for one, I can't access, access any of my uh, the columns I've written since, I, since I've been back at the paper. My plan... Yeah. Well, actually, I just did find one of them tucked in the book. So I'll be able to read one of the ones since okay. I've been back. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. But um, one a question I have before that is, uh, because your columns are in a you know wide public arena, a newspaper, I can only imagine that they, they uh, stimulate many responses. Um, <laughs> and I was curious... How, what is your relationship with those responses? Whether or not it's a letter to the editor, published or not, um, do you read them? Do they go into your mental arena and swirl around? Do they keep you up at night? 
Mm -hmm. uh, because that's something many people fear, I think, when they think about letting their writing out into the world. What will people say? But particularly your kind of writing, because it's to the minute and it's about public events and society and politics and all kinds of public shared things. So how is that for you? It's it's changed as I've gotten older because I realize that the, it's always nice when people have nice things to say about what you do. And for the most part, that's the response I get is positive stuff. But you can get 60 positive responses and it's that one negative one that will keep you up all night. And back in the day, meaning back you know, years ago and then when I was at, at the paper the, my first time around, uh, I would sometimes engage too much in in some with some of the readers. It was it's okay if someone disagrees and you can have a civil disagreement, but there were some folks who were, were trolling you, were just trying to to pick and what some people I was never going to convince. And comment sections on websites is like <laughs> the worst part of humanity. And I I, I I've told reporters try to young reporters, try not to read those because yeah. one thing when someone engages you with an email, it can still be nasty and everything, but it's it's those anonymous uh, comments on websites that can really get you down. So I, I, I'm i at the point now where I don't, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, I, I don't read a lot of those emails. And I know I'm missing a lot of the positive ones too, but I just, yeah, you, you want ev you want everyone to agree with what you write. You want everyone to like what you write, but that's not why you write. And if you let them get into your head, then you might stop writing, or you may stop writing in a way which is which is true to yourself. That being said, I do need to be better about responding to emails. Right. Um, your mentor, Maury Maverick Jr., and one of my mentors too. He probably had some interesting guidance regarding criticism. Uh, another mentor, I'd love to hear anything you remember, anything Maury ever told you about, about that topic. Uh, one of my mentors, the poet William Stafford, used to say, no praise or blame. You know, he wasn't out there writing his work so that he could accumulate bushels of praise, but also don't blame him if you don't like his poem, just move on, please. And um, I think it's a hard lesson sometimes. But mm -hmm. did Maury ever talk to you about criticism? Because certainly his columns uh, raised a few eyebrows now and then. The, the, one, the one thing I remember Maury saying is, it, it's kind of what I just said a few, a few minutes ago, it's just, just be true to yourself. I remember him saying that be, I think we in Clubhouse Barbecue on Broadway Street. And he said, be true to yourself. But beyond what he, what he said, it's what, what you just said about the the way he lived, the way he wrote, because he stirred a lot of controversy, he stirred a lot of passions, and and there are people who hated Moray for for his positions on different issues, um, but he never he never let that stop him. And yeah, I'm I'm like like you and many others. I'm proud to be one of Maury's children. You know, he never had children of his own, but you, myself, Mint, Jan Jarbo, Russell, Bob, there's so many who he just kind of took in and, and ad adopted. And, you know, by the way, he's going to, next January will be the 100th anniversary of his birth. So maybe we ought to think about doing something. But to me, he was just a symbol of, of, of intellectual and physical courage. And he's one of those people who I think about every day, every yes. day. Yes. And I, I always think about him when I drive anywhere near Brackenridge Park. Yes. <laughs> he used to say that, um, you know, he communicated with the owl in the tree. That was his teacher, his guru. And he also used to say that when he walked around, he saw two San Antonios, the, the gone San Antonio and the present San Antonio, and that it was very, um, very intense to live in a place for a long time and remember so many things that were were now gone. Carrie, could you grace us with with a column of uh, from the book or the one or the recent one that you found? Anything you'd like to read, just so we can hear your voice. And, and let me say also, Naomi, one of the most meaningful experiences of my life was 
a few years ago when you, Jan Jarbo, Russell, and, uh, and Bob Richter on two different Sundays cleaned out Maury's office and went through all of his books and papers and you know kept some for ourselves and do donated some to others. So I just wanted to close that on Maury. Uh, yeah, the, the one the one recent column I, I I I have access to I wasn't going I wouldn't read it because I'm actually it's it's one that I read for the for the event next week, but I did want to read something that was uh that was recent, meaning on this go around for me at the paper, and this was uh this column ran in March March 27, 2020. And it's, yeah, it's, it's self-explanatory. Helium is the element of drift. It is the second lightest element in the universe. It allows balloons released from our hands to ascend to the sun, whose Greek god Helios inspired its name. On Wednesday morning in San Antonio, there was no sun. And if there were balloons floating through the air, they wouldn't have been seen as the city awoke to its first day of shelter in place in a fog. Not just a metaphorical fog induced by coronavirus and our inability to see clearly ahead, to make out the outlines of a day when we return to normalcy, but a fog thick enough to shroud the city skyline and obscure people at a certain distance. At a certain distance is how we now measure our lives, whether standing in line at the store, working from home, of visiting the few places we can go when not at home. At a certain distance is how we bide our time. We are hoping the time is soon when the distance will be narrowed. At a certain distance, social distancing dictates our lives so our lives will be saved. That we're becoming more afraid for our lives and the lives of others is as clear as the empty streets and sidewalks of San Antonio, of downtown San Antonio. I'm a native San Antonian who has lived near or in and worked downtown most of my life. On Wednesday, during the 8 p.m. hour, Adamo Plaza and downtown were darker and less vibrant than any time in my memory. It was no more alive at 10 a.m. Thursday. In this brilliant memoir, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, John Philip Santos describes Houston Street as a long, dark avenue of ghosts. Today, that's not just Houston Street. It's Broadway, Commerce, Messoya, Navarro, Travis, Adamo Plaza, and Travis Park. But even the ghosts were absent. Walking through these streets Thursday, I felt like a character in one of the Twilight Zone episodes. The only person, or one of a scattered few, who have survived the destruction of the world. The wind blew, and because motorized and human traffic was almost non-existent, I could hear as well as see dry leaves scraping along the street, styrofoam cup tumbling down the sidewalk, plastic clinging to a parking meter and a piece of newspaper attached itself to a tree. Most of the people I've seen are the homeless who are sheltering in a place where they've been living, downtown streets. COVID-19 reminds us that a pandemic, like any tragedy afflicting a community and a nation, magnifies existing inequities and suffering, making more visible the people we didn't see or ignored because they were at a certain distance from our view and our conscience. Whether through homelessness or being one rent payment away from homelessness, unstable and low paying jobs, food insecurity, a lack of health insurance and sick paid leave, or the absence of computers and Wi-Fi for children now expected to learn online We've allowed too many people to drift from our attention, moral concern, and responsibility. Among the many challenges, some unprecedented, that we now face because of COVID-19, is aggressively attacking and eliminating these inequities. COVID-19 also magnifies the infection of loneliness. There are people, many but not all of them older, who were recluses before the virus came. And there are children whose own and there are people whose only sense of community was found in the churches, synagogues, mosques, and senior and community centers now closed. 
One of our greatest daily challenges during these times is remembering and keeping our eyes open for them, not letting them drift away, forgotten, as a prelude to their silent and unacknowledged deaths. We can't allow the necessity of being physically apart be the reason we don't stay in touch. That doesn't only include strangers and casual acquaintances, but also the people we know well and love. Thursday morning, on my way to Central Market, I drove past the Catholic Worker House, where a long line of the poor and homeless waited to be served breakfast. The line I stood in at Central Market was shorter, faster moving, and serenaded by saxophonist Joe Posada. As I entered the store, Posada was playing Al Green's Let's Stay Together. When I exited, he was halfway through Hall and Oates one-on-one. -on -one. Because we now measure time at a certain distance, with the hope of flattening the COVID-19 curve, our one-on-one -on -one interactions are spaced out, online and virtual. But in, through, and beyond this unprecedented time of separation, we must stay together. We need to stay together. We hold on tight to the strings of helium balloons when we're not ready to let them go. Let's hold on to each other so we don't drift apart. Mm. Such a powerful column, Carrie. It's so poignant. That saxophonist at Central Market playing Al Green, that's so mm. moving. And also that contrast, the Catholic worker line. I've passed that line early in the mornings too. And then the line at Central Market, um, a contrast there. It's such a poignant, honest, touching piece, really a piece we all could probably stand to read every day. Um, Thank you. We have a question that's come in, but before I ask it, I wanted you to just comment if you would on, and your piece does comment on this, um, the whole sense of, you know, altered universe, altered, altered uh, community that the pandemic has um, created around you in your life with your loved ones. Um, I was haunted too by that feeling of going through downtown and how empty it's mm -hmm. been so many times over the past six months. Um, could you just tell a little bit about that? And, and if you don't mind also, some people might appreciate hearing the fact that you were one of the, one of the mystery people who maybe fell into the cracks of, of the test not saying what you were really going through. Yeah. Um, well, the, first of all, this, the whole, this whole period that we're living in, it, it, it's, it's, it's surreal, but it's, it, the sad thing is I find that I'm almost getting used to it. And I guess in a way you have to kind of get used to it uh, because you don't know how long it's gonna last. I got sick in, in May. It started like the first uh, Mother's Day weekend. I, I started like the Friday before I started feeling something. And then by Tuesday, it really just hit me. And I was, I mean, for almost two weeks, I just wanted to lie down. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any coffee, uh, no sore throat. The worst, heaviest fatigue I've, I've ever experienced. Um, pain in my, in my legs and arms, in my fingers and, and toes, hallucin hallucinating. Uh, I mean, I, the voice, one of the voices I kept hearing in my hallucinations was the voice of, of Tim Kaine, the senator from Virginia who was, you know, Hillary Clinton's vice presidential running mate in, in 2016. And you know, I, I like Tim Kaine, but there's no reason that of all the voices that I'm hearing, it's, you know, it's not Naomi, it's not Barack Obama, or Alicia Keys, it's Tim Kaine. <laughs> <laughs> and I also had, and the other experience I kept on having was a, a, a play that Rod Strickland of the Spurs made in, in an 89 playoffs where he threw the ball away. And I mean, it's something only Spurs fans can agonize with. But those are the two things that I kept, that kept running through my mind over and over. And, and the thing about the fatigue is I couldn't sleep. So it was just like, it was, it was just wanted to stay there and wait for me. There came a point when I began to get to get better, uh, but I couldn't 
read or write for at least a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I had, not only did I not have the inclination to read or write, I couldn't read or write. I mean, I, 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 I see words and they meant nothing. I pick up a pen and try to write and I, and I, and I couldn't do it. And the, the, and I, and I had vertical and I still have the brain fog and I still have the vertical and, and sometimes I feel the fatigue. So whatever I had, because I did, I did test negative. I did, I know I had mononucleosis, which doesn't uh, preclude also having COVID. And, I, and doctors, people I spoke, everyone seems to think I had COVID. Uh, I just know whatever I had, it, 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 uh, it took a lot out of me. But I also know that there are people, people who you are close to, who had COVID, who had affected far, far worse than it did me. Because if I had it, I had a milder form of it. Well, I'm so relieved you did. And I'm so glad that you were able to come back to reading and writing but that must have felt very scary. And it also must have given you much more compassion for all the people who've been sick, um, whatever you had. And, and I also wanna thank everyone, you included everybody at, the, at, 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 at. What? I, I wanna thank everyone who, who was so concerned. Yeah. At the time, because it, you know, uh, well, you, you know, you, you know, you know, you know, I mean, you know that people care about you, but you also, you know, you also, you know, when you actually see it, and and yeah, to your question, I live, I live next door to some to 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 somebody who's got all kinds of physical problems, twenty years younger than me, and just has all kinds of issues. Probably shouldn't be living alone, and there are times when when uh, this person has to call 911 because they get locked in a position on the floor where they can't get up. And I see also that this, how this person struggles just to go through the day to, to, to go wash clothes or stuff. And during the time that I was, um, was, wasn't feeling well, was sick, I thought about all the people who were looking after me yeah. and, 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 and I also realized that whatever I was feeling was nowhere close to what, what, what this person is feeling, must be feeling all, all the time. Yeah. So it, it, you want to think that you're compassionate and that you're empathetic, but sometimes you have to, sometimes it doesn't even take getting COVID-19. Sometimes it, it, it can just be being nauseous yeah. and to realize what other people go through, folks who are nauseous because yeah. they're on chemotherapy. So right. it did, it did. I think make me, a, I hope make me a bit more empathetic to others. Well, that is your nature, but um, we can always use um, little recurrences of reminders. And that brings us to a second question. We have two good questions here from the same person, Erica, thank you. One of the questions that she's asked is, how can we be more mindful to notice the details of the everyday? Because I feel, and I'm so glad she asked that question, I do feel when you talk and when you write, you have that ability to select the details that will create the scene or take us to the place or give us the feeling that makes us either laugh or cry. And that's one thing I've always felt about your columns, that they're a little bit miraculous in that in their short length, one may laugh and cry within the same column. Um, but how can we be more mindful to notice details of the everyday? Thank you, Erica. Slow, slow, slowing down, to slow, bless you, to slow down. And I, I know one of my, one of my uh, faults, one of my problems in anything I do is, is, is going too fast and not taking enough time to, uh, to do something the way it should be done, but also to just observe and, and to notice. And then when something, catches your attention, catches your eyes, spend some time with it, spend some time looking at it, thinking about it. And I'm not saying this because it's you, but I mean, your poetry, I mean, uh, and, and I mean, people should read poetry anyway, because it's one of the things that helps you to pay attention to, to, to small things and to be more mindful, but, but you in particular, the, what, 
the, the vast array of, of, of topics that you that that you've written about. It's just a matter of of honoring honoring what you see because we do take stuff for granted. Yes. And I've gotten to the habit now where when I go for walks, I don't have like a sports station on. I don't, I'm not, I'm not even listening to music. I, I, I'm just, I'm just watching and listening and trying to be open to what ever is out there that may not, not, not necessarily be something that I, that I write about, although that's always good, but just something that will make me a better person and more thoughtful and more, more open and more, and more compelled to, to do more than I, yeah. I do to help others. Well, you're staying tuned, Carrie, and that has been so evident through all of your, your writing that you're, you're tuned into the world around you and, and you have an enormous amount of care for it. Um, I do think maybe you could write a letter to Tim Kaine and, <laughs> and just tell him yeah. that you've been thinking about him because he's not on TV as much as he used to be. He yeah. might be feeling lonely. <laughs> and I think he'd be happy to know he appeared in your hallucination. No, we do I, have a, another question. And I'd like to, I'd like to invite our uh, generous circle of listeners tonight. Please feel free to type in any question you might have for Carrie, and I'll channel it over to him. But um, Erica had also asked earlier, and I'm curious about this too, uh, what in your opinion has been the funniest column you've ever written? Or is there a certain realm of topics which for you just kind of stirs up the humor? Boy. I know it's hard sometimes yeah, to the, the superlatives. The, like the, the funniest, funniest. It's, it, it's hard to, right now to think of the funniest. I probably if I leaf through the book, uh, humor. That's not that's not any anything particular that which will stir the humor. Uh, when I first started writing, I didn't I didn't think of myself as somebody who was going to be writing funny. Try to write humor. Uh, it just at, at a, there came a point when it's it kind of came upon me, and uh, and and sometimes I, I realized it it was because I needed a break for some of the serious stuff I was writing, yeah. and 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 satire or or humor just to be funny. I mean, satire has a can have a point, should have a point, but sometimes just to you know just to write a column about you know, donuts, Krispy Kreme donuts, it, 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 there's, there's no point in it. Uh, but if it can bring a laugh, it can bring a laugh. And uh, so there they came a point when I realized that I, 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 was, that I could write humor and, uh, and some people who respected the humor more than the serious stuff and vice versa. The, the, the strange thing is that since I've been back at the paper, I've not quite been able to hit that that humor bug and I miss it. And I know, and I won't be, I won't feel like I'm back until I'm able to do that again. Right. Well, do you think it might have anything to do with the times we're living in? I think it has a lot to do with it. Yeah. It has, it has think, a lot to do with it. Yeah. 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 Well, I it's still in there. I know you have it. It'll come out again. Um, Mary has asked a great question here. Can you talk about your love of music and how or if that informs your writing? I mean, I, 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 I love music. I love, uh, uh, I love, I love all forms of music for the most part, except for heavy metal. But at the heart of, of what I love is, is, is R and B, is soul. Uh, you know, singers like you know, Marvin Gaye, Aretha Franklin. I love music, and one way I do think, two ways I'm influenced by music. One is that the way a Marvin Gaye can, or Al Green or Darrell Hall can change voices, can go, you know, from, ten, you know, I, I, I try to do that sometimes with writing. So that's, that's why sometimes I, 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 want, I want to be serious. I want to be funny. I want to be more reflective. 
But the other way, the more important way that music work has always worked with me, and, and especially when I was back in the day when I was writing more humor, was that there'd be, there'd be some days, Naomi, when I didn't know what I was going to write about. Mm -hmm. My column was due that day and for tomorrow, and I didn't know what I was going to write about. But while walking, if I, I would have a, a melody in my head. And if I had like a, if it was like a, a ballad, not a particular song, but it was like, like a ballad playing in my head, I knew that the column was going to be serious, was going to be reflective. Mm. Um, I just had to find the topic. If, the, if, if, if I had like a, a hip hop, yeah, jazzy kind of thing going in my head. That's what I knew it was going to be a funny column. But again, I had to find I had to find the topic. So in those cases, the music and the melody was dictating the column was dictating whether it was going to be serious or funny. And and uh, and I have begun to feel that more. I just haven't been able to execute it. But but music, someone I was on a Zoom panel earlier today, and people were asking us, "How do how do you take care of yourself? Uh, how do you do the self care thing in this time that we're living in?" And every night I listen to music. Every night I listen to music before going to bed. Music that I yeah. love. Yeah, beautiful. What a what a fascinating answer. I'm so glad that that uh, Mary asked that question. And it sounds like you have just these different channels that are helping to guide your writing that's coming coming forth during the day. Um, Susan has asked if you have listened to the Black Pumas yet. No, I haven't. The Black well, Pumas, I'm writing that down now. Yeah, write that down. I would ask, have you listened to Burna Boy? No, I haven't. <laughs> write him down, <laughs> okay. write him down. Okay, we have a, a few more great questions here. Um, John Philip is saying this. <laughs> Photographs of a stranger on your grandmother's refrigerator, death wow. of a beloved cat, witnessing a fatal motorcycle accident. So many recent columns have been about things that happened before your eyes. Is this something that has always been a part of your life and writing, or is it something that's coming on in some inexplicable way now? And and by the way, I love all those columns he's mentioned. Too. <laughs> they're they're some of my favorites of recent days. I, I think it's both, and actually, I think the I think the if I had a one of the, one of the nominees for one of my favorite funny columns would be the uh, the yeah the picture of the white people in my grandmother's <laughs> refrigerator. But I I think that uh, I, I think that's always been. Uh, I mean, that's part of. I guess why I, why everyone writes is you see things, you observe things, and you want to find a way to articulate them to, to, uh, to, to write about them. This year does has been, has 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 been like on, uh, amped up on adrenaline on on yeah. meth or something because in fact John Philip had told you know John Philip once he, he, we were talking not too long ago and he was he listed all of those things he mentioned me getting sick and he mentioned uh George Floyd and everything he just said I, I, I was probably in, in, in need of some kind of a cleansing or something but it, it has been a uh, an interesting year and actually that was one one of the columns I would have read if I had been able to get my hands on it was the one about the motorcyclist because it did it 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 did show the best in people how people respond to the discomfort and suffering of a stranger and uh yeah but to what john phillips said it's, it's both it's something that's always been there but it does seem to be heightened in in 2020 mm -hmm. yeah um uh, what advice would you give to young people interested in creative writing that's from gina gina read read mm -hmm. and write i mean that's the most those are the two the two most simplistic but the two most realistic answers is to read and write but also to observe and uh, back to what we were talking earlier to be more mindful of everything that's going around you uh, keep keep notebooks keep notebooks they're, they're, 
they are such a treasure when you keep them over the years and you get to be a certain age and you can go back to a particular year, a particular time and see what you were writing and see what you were thinking. But also it's a source of material for which you can use to, to write, but always, always have a, a, a notepad, paper, a pen, pencil with you and you know, by your nightstand. And when that, when that great thought, that idea, that, that image comes to mind, don't wait till later to, to write it down because it will disappear. Write it down now. And, 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 but yeah, but read, write, observe, take notes, open yourself to the world. And mm. don't let folks, and don't let folks tell you you can't do it. And don't be discouraged by the rejections because that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the questions are rolling in now. I love this, this stream, the wave of questions. Um, also, I wanted to pass on this compliment from Susan. She still loves your older columns about you people. Oh. Uh, yeah. And I, can, I can read that one later. I can read that one. Okay. We could, why don't we close with one of those at okay. the end? That might be good. Um, we have a question from Patricia. What are you reading right now or recently? Is there anything you've read lately that you would recommend for this time? I'm reading Cast uh, by Isabel Wilkerson. Mm. Uh, which, which, boy, it's it's a lot of books uh, that are essential, essential to our time. But uh, when it, in talking about race, and um, not race and just race in this country, but race in India, race mm. everywhere, uh, it really does kind of um, help you understand things better. I'm. Uh, I'm 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 doing a lot of reading for an anthology I'm I'm working on, on Black Texas writers for for uh, the Ritliff book collection series and Texas A&M University Press. So I've been doing a lot of write, uh, reading of, of 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 Black Texas writers. Uh, some as recent, you know, Attica Locke and going back in the day, Sutton Griggs, and so I, I, like, mo mo most recently I'm I find myself because that's, I have a deadline coming up with that. You know how that is. And, but I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of black Texas writers because I, I realized that while I've thought a lot in my lifetime about what it is to be black in the United States and what it means to be black in San Antonio where you know, there's only six or 7% of us, I'd never really thought about what it meant to be black in Texas, yeah. which is different yeah. than being black in the United States in some ways. And, and this project, uh, this anthology is helping me to, to understand and realize this deeper. It's wonderful that you're doing that book, Carrie, and I think it's going to be a fantastic new resource for so many of us. And we really appreciate, I know how, um, what a labor of love it is to make an anthology. So thank you for all the time you're taking to do that. Um, uh, there are two questions that sort of go together from the founder of Gemini Inc., Nan Cuba. Hi, Nan. How would you describe the spirit and people of San Antonio? And then Erica has also asked, what is your hope for San Antonio's future? So maybe if you could say something relating to both of those about our dearly beloved city of which you are such an important part. San Antonio is were laid back, and I, I in, in that way, I think I kind of reflect San Antonio because I'm I'm laid back sometimes too laid back, but I think we're, we're laid back in a way that we we don't get overly excited, overly except when the Spurs win a championship. We don't get overly excited or chagrined about much. We we take things in stride, but we also there's just to live in San Antonio is to always feel like you're breathing history and always uh, experiencing all the different cultures that, 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 that make this city. I think there's a tendency sometimes for us in San Antonio to pat ourselves on the back too much and, 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 and say that you know, we don't have the problems of other cities, which is a lie. Every city has the same problems. I do think that there's a way that we in San Antonio, I think, and I think it's because, it is because of our demographic makeup. We, 
you know, two thirds Latino, and then 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 whites, and then you know, blacks six or seven percent, then all the other different cultures. There is a way through this multicultural and this 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 laid back and uh, historic lens that th there's this deep well of concern for each other. I had an editor at the paper, Craig Thomason, who used to always say, never underestimate the heart of San Antonio. Never and and that's one of the, and that's one of the one of the things which which gives me hope for not just the city but for the nation as 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 dark as things are mm -hmm. uh, is is that things are going to be tough things are going to always going to be difficult and sometimes things may be at their most difficult but and no and no his his time in history is always like the other one but still we always find a way to get through those difficult times in history and uh the older i get i'm, I'm just more proud to to be a, a, a san antonian it's not another city that i would want to say that i'm from because it's still kind of a cool thing to say you're from san antonio and, and a lot of folks are still learning about our city and our history how big we are uh so I'm, i i yeah i'm proud to be a san antonio i should have worn my san antonio t-shirt and and carrie i think you've helped us all all these years love san antonio more because you've shown us angles and aspects and helped us make new friends and um see things from different perspectives so thank you for that you have deepened san antonio for everybody um thank you. ben our friend ben has asked uh about the internet in this crisis we've become so dependent on it and I'm going to read from Ben's question. One worries that the thing you alluded to before, namely the cover of anonymity it permits, is serving to enable and even incite callousness and to drive the polarization that has come to characterize our condition. Would you care to comment on the pros and cons of social media and to share your thoughts on how it might be used to build bridges and help people to address their anger as opposed to merely deepening our divisions. That's, good. Yeah, that's actually uh, something that I was on discussion with earlier today. Uh, social media is all that. It's all, it, 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 it can be where people hide hiding behind anonymity and just be nasty. I mean, Twitter can be the nastiest place on earth, but Twitter can also be one of the most uh, community building places on earth. And I think, and also, I think you see a lot of young people using social media to become active in, in, in social movements and in, in the political process and connecting with one another. Uh, like every, everything has, has, is good and bad, but I, I think uh, Twitter, all social media has the ability to, to widen our scope and also widen our empathy and the things we should care about. And I don't think that uh, there's necessarily a contradiction between social media, new media, and the old media that I'm associated with the newspapers, because I use Twitter as a, as a source of, of, of finding stories and or, or I find stories on media from newspapers and magazines and radio and shows that I wouldn't know about if I wasn't connected to Twitter. So it's a wonderful source of, of, inf of information and, and connection, but I also believe that we all should take holidays from it and one or two days at a time and, and not get so lost in it. And it, I, I, I speak as someone who's not been good at doing that, but I find that when I do, if I just take a day away from that, including emails, I feel better, I feel, a little bit more alive and more alert, and I don't feel as exhausted. Thank you for that answer, Carrie. Thank you for all your answers. I know we're coming down the, the pike here of the hour, and I want to hear your, your um, last piece that you'll read to us, but uh, we had a question from Steve to talk about how we got to know each other, which I actually don't remember 
I guess I through do. Maury, through Maury Maverick? No, actually it was uh, through Bob Richter. Oh, okay. It was through Bob, Bob Richter who, my, my entry into the Express News was from, with Maury introducing me to Bob who was the associate page editor of the editorial board back in the nineties. And he was friends with you. And uh, we ended up meeting at one of your book signings at the Trig Bookstore in September of 1995. I'm pretty sure that's the date. September well, of well yeah, um, all I can say is I really miss all the great meals we've had together in restaurants. And we were also asked what sorts of adventures and misadventures we've had together. <laughs> and I do remember um, over the many years, seems like everything I was involved with, they always wanted you to be the master of ceremonies. Always, <laughs> no matter what it was, who it was, where it was. And so I feel like we were together in so many different venues because, I mean, that just speaks to how everybody in our city loves you. They wanted you to be the person to welcome and to guide the whole evening. So I do feel like we've been together a lot through the years, but I think- I, mean, I feel like we've been through a lot together also. In our we have definitely been through a lot. And um, Steve, next time we have a meal with you in a restaurant, we'll talk about that. <laughs> but in terms of misadventures, I, did, I don't know if it was a misadventure, but it was certainly the most poignant adventure was to clear out the beloved office of Maury Maverick Jr. And to be there yeah. for the sorrow of it and the hilarity of it and yeah. all of the incredible treasures we discovered and um, and just to be able to experience him um, in a full sort of a full appreciation of his wonderfulness and what he meant to so many people in his life that was something I would not have wanted to do without you Carrie it would have been too difficult I feel the same and, way thank you and also, I wanted to have my last question comment be, thank you for, for all the people who asked questions tonight and sorry for the couple we didn't get to, um, to answer. But um, you, you have such a voice. It's a distinct voice. It's a clear voice. And you encourage others. I've heard you do this a million times. You encourage everyone to share voice. We have to hear one another. We have to know who that person is living next door to us. We have to know a little bit about the stories of so many people. Um, and I know that right now, you and I are both mesmerized by the voices of a relative, different relatives, one you have and one I have, who are younger than the age of five. Um, what does your relationship with your young person's voice um, give you these days? I feel that mine has completely saved my life in the past six months. Yeah. Relationship um, with the child's voice. I, I, I agree totally. And, and I mean, in your, yeah, kind of does that. Your, I mean, your kind of does that for me also being around him. But Makai is, he, he makes me laugh more than anybody. And, you know, he also, I, I look at him, he's two years old and he doesn't know what's going on. He's, I mean, he has a 10-year-old sister, Leanna, who's going to be able to remember these differences in her life when things change, whereas Makai is growing into this. I mean, what, you know, what, so it, what it does for me as someone who, you know, never got around to having children, to put it that way, uh, but he, my, my, my nephew, my great nephew does for me, and, and also Leanna is, reminds me that yeah we say we have to do stuff for the children and we do something for the future but these are two flesh and blood people who show me every day that yeah that's that's why we do what we do and that's why we you know that's why you, you can't you can't you can't you can't you have no excuse to to get weary and to stop we're going to get exhausted but you have no you have no excuse as long as there are children, as long as there are generations coming after you to, to not do cliche, make the future, make the world better for them. I, someone said today, when we put so much on young people, when you ask young people to be involved leading these social movements, 
what does that say about us? And it, it's, yeah, it's, it's an indictment against us for not doing more to, to leave them less work to do. So I look at you know, these, these, these children and say, we need to do the work so they won't have to. And you know we do have we you know if you truly believe in a beloved community if you truly believe in the ideals you say that that you have then you also have to believe that it's possible that they can be attained. Uh, so as long as it's possible and as long as you're able to draw breath and as long as you have these little ones looking at you, then do the work and 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 truly make this a world that that's not only safer for them, but they can look at you and say, well, you did your part to help make it a little bit better. Hmm. Thank you, Carrie, for making all of our worlds so much better. And could we please close with your piece? I've never read this and I wouldn't have even thought about reading this except uh, for Susan. And Susan referring to this particular mm -hmm. column and this, uh, God, this was written this was written in January of 1996, but the title of it was Not All You People in, in Family. And I was actually in La Crosse, Wisconsin when I wrote this. Uh, and this goes to what you were talking about, the responses to my column. And so this, it starts off with this, a female caller who called into my voicemail. And this is what she said. White people have all the brains in this country. You people don't have you people don't have any manners. You people need to get educated and learn to speak English. So this is the color, how the column starts. I wrapped myself in these warm sentiments, and I've never read this column. I haven't read this column since I wrote it. I wrapped myself in these warm sentiments, which were politely and articulately expressed, as I journeyed here to Wisconsin to scour the frozen tundra for the legendary you people. The you people are known to inhabit dark, dark and unexplored hinterlands. While they have been seen most prominently among people of Negroid descent, there have been sightings of them among various species. For years, scientists and explorers have marveled at the adaptability of you people and their ability to melt into other groups. My personal interest in you people stems from an incident at a swimming pool when I was nine years old and in a summer program at the YMCA. Before going into the pool, all of us kids, little people, lined up so that the program director, Bob, could put suntan lotion on us. When it was my turn, Bob gave me a puzzled look. I didn't think you people use suntan lotion, he said. Instinctively, I sensed what he meant. As I looked around the Animal Heights pool, I realized that if I was a you people, there wasn't a lot of you people swimming. The discovery that the blood of you people flowed in my veins was an exciting time for me. It, more than anything else, set me on my distinguished scientific career. On that particular day of childhood revelation, I raced home to tell my family, hey, y'all, I shouted, we're you people. We know the answer, but which part of us? I knew what they meant. My family and genes are made up of a lot of you people, African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Haitians, Italians, and yes, Anglos. One of my great-great-grandfathers was a French Jew. Another one was an Anglo slave owner. Back then the paper must have made sure we wrote Anglo instead of white. A great-great-uncle was a ruffian who was killed in a gunfight with Wild Bill Hickok in Abilene, Kansas. Uncle Phil was the white sheep of the family. African Americans in my family have skin tones ranging from white to black. Both of my grandmothers could have passed for white, which means, dear caller, when you're talking to you, your people about you people, you may actually be talking to a you people. My family looks like M&M candies minus the green ones and those new blue ones. Apparently, great great grandpa T had a remarkable tolerance for you people during the late nights he slipped out to the slave quarters when the missus was asleep. See, one of the first things I discovered in my search for you people is that they may not be a pure breed. My research and studies show that it takes a lot of other people to make you people. So which you people are we? 
rich roots. Alex Haiti had it easy. He only had to go to Africa. My travels were taking me all over the world. Here in the heartland of the United States of you people, my search is once again proving futile. I have slogged through the snow and ice of this region's dairies, careful not to step on inebriated Green Bay Packer fans who lie face down in the snow. I believe they may be a new breed of you people, but they're too young to be of any use to me. Perhaps I'll have to face the reality that you people don't exist and that lineage is false. Maybe I'll have to study the theory that the you people are a myth created by a species called the Incredibus ignoramus. But I've been searching too long to stop now. The you people are out there somewhere and I will find them and I won't stop there. After I've discovered the you people, I will begin my search for their equally legendary cousins, those people. <laughs> Gary, that was terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here tonight. And anyone who doesn't have Clowns and Rats Scare Me from Trinity mm -hmm. University mm -hmm. Press, still available. And thank you for all you have given us always. Bravo, thank bravo. You, my sister. Thank you. Thank you for everybody out there. Thank you, Gemini Inc. Gemini Inc. Next week. Thank you. Yeah.